we'll, uh, we'll do this briefing in two parts. First, uh, uh, General uh, Sheehan, who's the Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Command and well known to you all, is going to brief on Haiti and the uh, final moments of our mission in Haiti, and then I'll take questions on, on other topics. I want to be clear that the uh, topic of General Sheehan's briefing is Haiti and not other islands. Uh, he will not take uh, questions on Cuba. Um, I'd like to point out that if we had done this briefing at this time last year, we would have uh, about 46,000 migrants in Guantanamo Bay, and we would have had about 8,000 troops in Haiti. Uh, and what General Sheehan is going to talk about today is the uh, uh, schedule for removing the last American troops for Haiti and completing our mission there. And as you know, some of you actually went down to cover the story. Um, we have all the migrants now, or virtually all the migrants, out of Guantanamo Bay. So with that introduction, General Sheehan. Good afternoon. Uh, what I'd like to do is kind of review, as Ken said, uh, the Haiti story from September of 94 to where we are today. Uh, many of you and I were in this room back in September talking about the introduction of U.S. forces to Haiti, and there was all sorts of speculation as to what the outcome was going to be, could you get out of the place, et cetera. And what I'm here to report is that success part of the story that says uh, we are, in fact, leaving, and I'd like to go over that schedule with you now. First, the uh, current mandate will expire on the 29th of this month. The Security Council currently is discussing the extension of that mandate at the request of the government of Haiti. That extension will be for a period of about six months. All U.S. forces that are currently in Haiti, and today there are about 1,907 on the ground in Haiti, uh, will be out by the 15th of April. The majority will be out by the uh, 15th of March. As a matter of fact, on the 29th, uh, when I fly to Haiti to bring out General Kinzer, the un UNMI commander, no U.S. forces will be conducting security operations except for their own self-protection in the Port-au-Prince area. We will, on a bilateral relationship, maintain contact with the Cuban government in terms of an exercise schedule, and I'll get into a few more details on that later on. Sorry, Haitian. Since... <laughs> Since I brought that up, we'll return to Haiti. Uh, this is a chronology, if you'll all remember, uh, back in here when uh, President Carter, Colin Powell, and Sam Nunn, and uh, General Bates went down to Cuba. Uh, we then followed up the next day with the introduction of U.S. forces on the 19th of September. That number grew to almost 21,000. Immediately after that, we started pulling forces out. We took the naval forces out, took the Marines out of Cape Haitian, and left essentially the 10th Mountain Division and the other augmentation as part of the multinational force. Here, uh, in January of 95, we declared uh, Haiti a safe and secure environment for the transition uh, to the UNMI forces. UNMI took over on the 31st of March uh, of 95. That was a force of about 6,000. Uh, the U.S. slice of that, if you remember correctly, was about 2,000. And so this is where we've been during this period. During this period, there had been four elections in Haiti, uh, four elections in which various representations and parts of the parliament were selected. And finally, out in here, the president-elect, uh, President Braval, was elected. And he was inaugurated on the 7th of February of 96. And so, as I indicated, at the end of this month, the UNMI mission, as is currently constructed, will in fact end. And starting on the 1st of March, we'll start redeploying forces with the bulk of the forces out by the 15th of April. And I'll get into a little more detail about that. This is what it looks like, uh, and this is about where we are. The Dutch Marines have left the Jacmel area. There are now no U.S. forces in the Southern Claw. Uh, U.S. forces, the Pakistani forces, Canadians, Bangladesh, and Djibouti forces are the only remaining forces currently in Haiti. U.S. forces, as I indicated on the 1st of March, will cease security operations. Today and tomorrow, they will be continuing operations in Zone 5, which is the Port-au-Prince area. But for all intent and purposes, the Bangladesh contingent currently is the QRF and the Palace Guard in the Haiti area. The Pakistanis are up north at Cape Haitian, and the Djiboutians are in the Port-au-Prince area doing port security. U.S. forces will withdraw into this area. 
Canadian forces are currently in place as part of the multinational force, but they will be augmented from a rotational force from Canada. This force, by the time the transition takes place, will be about 2,000 forces, mostly made up of uh, Canadians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis. There will be some Americans there until the 15th of April. Those are the U.S. hospital, the landing craft that are providing logistic support, and some median lift capability that will stay in country working with the U.N. as part of the requirement that we have. But they don't have a security role. They are there strictly as support troops. The U.S. forces piece drawdown will end, as I said here. We will then engage uh, the government of Haiti at Pre President Proval's request to do some medical and engineering support. We will rotate construction type forces, uh, CVs, Red Horse, whatever have you, into the country to do construction projects at the specific request of President Proval using Haiti, Haitian or international money. Uh, what President Proval did was he went around to every district in the uh, country and asked them, what is the one project that you have that, you, that we can do for you we being the Haitian government, that will really make a difference in your life. And most of those projects are essentially are repairing a bridge, paving a road, putting in electric power, uh, or restoring electric power, fixing wells, and those of those natures. So we in the international community and the UN will continue that type of engineering work, but the number of people that are there will be about 200 people. It may grow to three to 400, depending on the, the rotation, the engineering projects, and we expect that to only last but another year. The UN mandate, as I said, the extension, if everything works out, will run for an additional six months. So that's the plan. That's where we are today. And what I'd like to do is turn it over to questions. You use the C word, so we have to ask you that. <laughs> Does the sequence of events over the weekend tell you that this was uh, essentially a Cuban trap? Uh, Ken has advised me that um, not to speak about Cuba, and so I need to play by the rules. Okay. Uh, Representative Weldon this morning gave an estimate of the cost to the Pentagon of about $80 million to train the Haitian police force. Does that sound like a, a, an on-the-mark estimate? I'd have to, to I'd have to, uh, the original numbers that I saw uh, were about $35 million to train about six to 7,000 HNP, Haitian National Police, um, both in terms of providing them equipment, training, et cetera. So that number signs, sounds a little high to me. I'd have to do some research, but the original numbers I saw were about $35 million. Who will conduct this training? This is not it is the, the Haitian National Police, the formal training for that six or 7,000 people is completed. Uh, what they're talking about doing now is having as part of the UN mission a civpol, civil police, about 300 civil police from French-speaking nations. And what they will do is they will stay in Haiti to mentor that, that police force. The police force, as you know, is currently kind of one of the links, one of the weak links in this transitional process. It's not as uh, uh, sophisticated or, very frankly, nor is it properly, as properly led as it needs to be, and so it needs some more mentoring. Yeah. Are these construction forces that are going to remain there for a year, are they um, among the folks who are already there, or are you going to be... No, they're rotational them? forces. We are bringing all the... For example, the Red Horse unit that finished building uh, or repairing uh, Truman Boulevard, uh, they're coming out uh, starting tomorrow. And then we will bring down various organizations, reserve forces, National Guard, some active duty units to work on specific projects. We are still working with the Haitian, Haitian government, scoping those projects to make sure that they're the right projects. What's your analysis on how the country will fare once the mandate's over? I think that uh, we have consistently been pleasantly surprised about the evolution of democracy in Haiti. Uh, remember back in September when we stood here and talked about this, there were all sorts of dire predictions about Haitian on Haitian violence, et cetera. Uh, most of those predictions did not come true. I think in the case of Haiti, its evolution down the road to democracy will be slow. There will be occasionally uh, some problems with it, but I think at the end of the day, Proval has the talent that it takes to bring together a good cabinet and move Haiti down the road to democracy. The other optimistic part that I find is when I talk to the elites of Haiti, uh, they are very different than they were two years ago. I think they genuinely understand for the first time that this is the last opportunity that that country has to genuinely to make it. And so they are engaged. They're building 
uh, local projects. They are investing some of their own money in their own country. So I'm optimistic. But the foreign investment is still drastic. Foreign investment is behind what we thought it was going to be. But that will take some confidence-building measures on the part of the Haitian government. It will take Proval to come to grips with the privatization issue. Could you be a little more specific with the elites and their investment? Yeah, they, um, at one time, uh, the major families of Haiti were purely uh, extractive in terms of what they took from the country and, and kind of left. What you see now is that some of the larger families are building schools um, for younger Haitians to teach them trades that are applicable uh, to, the, to the assembly sector. Uh, they are putting in money investment in terms of restoration of some of the roads and infrastructure. It's at least a hopeful sign. And I think that they really understand that they have to do this or the country isn't going to make it. What families and how much money? I, I don't know the total dollar value, but the um, three of the four major families are, in fact, investing. Mevs, Brants, et cetera. General, what are, what are the, uh, the attempt to reform the uh, security forces, uh, police especially, and uh, the, uh, the, the violence uh, done uh, to those uh, in the political process, the terrorism, et cetera? Has, has that, uh, can you quantify or qualify that, that improvement? The, the 6,000 plus Haitian National Police that we have down there that are part of the police force, um, by and large, aren't bad kids. Uh, they're the best that, that Haiti had to offer when we put uh, them through the training program. The real issue was the Haitian police leadership, uh, starting with the chief of police, Danny Toussaint, and working the way down. Uh, most of those people are now being flushed out of the system, being replaced by uh, police that have some leadership skill, but very frankly, very little substantive background. So that's what the CivPol piece will be, is to mentor those guys, to help them out, to teach them how to become legitimate lieutenants and sergeants. Uh, the economic violence that you speak about goes on. Uh, it is not as bad as it used to be, but nevertheless, it's still an extremely poor country. Uh, and because the judicial system still is in infant stages, there are instances where the people in local slum areas do, in fact, take justice into their own hands and kill people who steal things. And the political system? Um, the political piece, I don't think, is um, anywhere near what it was advertised back in the days when the uh, attaches were running around in were for hire. Uh, I don't know of any political violence that has occurred over the last four months. Are six to 7,000 police officers enough? That's what the Haitian government says that they need. I think that as Proval goes through this transitional process, I think he has to come to grips with uh, with uh, what the real number is. I don't think that they have a real feeling for it, frankly, because I think that they have, they have had no experience of professional police force. As you know, in the old days, the country was run by the FOD, and essentially, even within the FOD, there was only one heavy weapons country, c company that controlled the city of Port-au-Prince, and they did that through violence. So I think that uh, over time, it might be the right number, but they'll have to be, uh, their capability has to be significantly increased in terms of dealing with the problems. General, you said the, uh, the uh, engineering projects we were going to do down there would be with the uh, Haitian or international money. Uh, d uh, are we part of that international uh, yes. money? Yes. US, U.S. government is engaged uh, in terms of its AID projects and economic assistance, et cetera. Um, but there's a large uh, quantity of money. We're talking about 80 and $90 million to do some of the major repair work. We have gotten uh, countries such as um, Japan to invest in power, power distribution. Canada has contributed, France has contributed, Germany has contributed, and so uh, they are now generating more power than they have in the last five years in Port-au-Prince. Yes, ma'am. Do you support extending the UN mandate for six months, and if so, why? Uh, I support it because, first off, I think that uh, this is, is a success story. I think this is a case where the UN and the U.S. Uh, went to a country clearly understood what its mission was. They worked very, very well together. And I think it's an absolute success story from that perspective. And in the world, when you deal with the UN, I think you want to reinforce success. I think you want to stay engaged in Haiti because it's, it's in infant stages. It will require some mentoring and some processes to do that. But I think that that can be done by the international organization. And I think the Bangladeshi forces, the Pakistanis, and the Canadians are the right force to do that. So, so even if the mandate is extended, there won't be additional U.S. forces? No. What role will uh, Aristide play in your, in your view over the next several years? And can you update us on whatever 
if Cedrus and his friends in Panama, what their status is? Um, I, I was with Aristide uh, about 10 days ago, and he truly uh, intends to start some type of uh, foundation uh, for literacy programs in the slums, slums of City Soleil and Carrefour in uh, Port-au-Prince. His wife Mildred and he are both very, very dedicated to the poor people of Haiti, and I think that uh, he's going to be true to his word. He is still very much a very popular figure in Haiti, and as such is someone that uh, uh, the people are going to turn to. Uh, but he has been very supportive of President Braval. But I think he will, uh, he will mostly focus on the poor people in trying to change their lot in life. I think that the, uh, the words that Mildred used when I talked to her was that she said, hand in hand, uh, my husband and I and the poor people of Haiti are going to take the next step in the next chapter of the evolution of Haiti. Haiti. So I believe him. You, uh, I don't remember you as being one of the biggest doubters about this company being pulled off. Nope. Au contraire. Uh. <laughs> I think you're on the opposite side of the mic. But uh, so you, you are duly impressed with. Uh... I, am, I am impressed in the sense that um, I always thought we could do it. Uh, what I didn't know was what the price was that we would have to pay in terms of uh, casualties, both especially in the Haitian on Haitian violence, because uh, we thought that, very frankly, the society had so polarized that there was, in fact, going to be some transitional violence. It didn't take place. And so from that perspective, uh, I'm very, very, very happy. Will you do an after-action report uh, as yes. Commander-in-Chief, and will that be made available to the public? Yes. We are going to, as a matter of fact, we, we, we've actually done three levels of after exercise reports, and first at the tactical level, what does the troops need to do in terms of training, non-lethal technologies for crowd control and all those kinds of things. We are bringing in all the former commanders, uh, in, plus the interagency, uh, down to Norfolk. Uh, I think it's next month. And we're going to walk through this whole thing to kind of find out uh, what we could have done better. Because it's like any other uh, operation of this nature. There are three parts of an operation. There's the military piece, there's the economic piece, and there's a political piece and they need to be in concert to get to where, you, where you, you need to go for a success story. In some cases, there was good news and bad news. Yeah. Are there any general uh, lessons you can draw from this? I mean, if, you know, if things had gone wrong, you would say, here are the lessons learned. If things didn't go wrong. Are there <coughs> things that you would recommend doing on a similar mission in the future? I think the, what we purposely did when we, we put this operation together, we went back into the Somalia experience and scrubbed all the kinds of lessons learned and found out where the points of friction were between U.S. forces and U.N. forces, the command and control structure, the sharing of intelligence and all those kinds of things. So we purposely went out, out of our way to fix those kinds of problems. I think the lesson that um, comes out of this is that peacekeeping operations can be successful. Uh, they can be successful in a world of this nature. If you define your goals, uh, very carefully, and you stick to your goals. But it takes engagement. It takes uh, personal interest, uh, staying on top of the problem, making sure little problems don't become big problems, because when you're talking about an operation of this nature uh, where there are 15 different nations, 34 different languages, uh, in multiple kinds of approaches to problems, it requires a great deal of attention. And so I think that that's the lesson that I've learned out of this process that uh, when you go to Haiti, in my case, I spend as much time talking to the Bangladeshi contingent, the Pakistani contingent, the Djiboutians, as I do talking to my U.S. forces, because clearly we all need to learn from this process, and there's, there's plenty of things you can learn in this kind of a world. If I could, on another subject. Sure. Uh, today is the second anniversary of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Command In fact, there have been some complaints that, uh, that it hasn't really changed the numbers on uh, people people being booted out. As a sink, uh, from your perspective, how do you think this policy has affected things, if at all, uh, better, worse, uh, no difference? Ken Bacon's going to cover the statistics right after uh, I, get off, I get off stage. Okay. He's not a sink, though. Yeah, he's not a sink. What's that? He thinks he's a sink. I haven't read the statistics, frankly. Uh, my, my reaction is from someone who's, who deals with troops on a day-to-day -day basis. I think there's something wrong with the statistics. I can't tell you what it is because I haven't had time to delve into it. But I will tell you from a troop perspective, they understand what the policy is, and I don't know of anybody that has purposely sub subverted the process. Are you saying if you, 
You're not aware, you're not personally aware of any harassment going on? No. Around. And I spend a lot of time talking to troops, and I've got to tell you something. Today's young kids, if they, if they think they've got a problem, they'll come and find you and tell you. Ken, good luck. Thank you. Thank you,